Okay, I think we are ready to start. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, my name is Finn Balding Thompson, and I'm the International Green Key Director. And I'm very happy to present today's webinar to you on behalf of the whole uh, Green Key International team. This webinar is uh, part of uh, Green Key's uh, biodiversity campaign that actually started in January of this year and runs until August. Besides this series of webinars, we also have other components in our campaign, uh, namely a biodiversity quiz uh, that you can take to test your knowledge, an online course uh, to learn more about the topic of uh, biodiversity. And then we will have a biodiversity giveaway campaign uh, that will start in uh, early June, so next month. You can find all these details about our initiatives on, uh, on the Green Key website, which is uh, greenkey.global. Today, is the third webinar in our webinar series. Today, we'll focus on suggestions for how hotels and other tourism establishments can take concrete actions to support biodiversity in the hospitality industry. And uh, I would like to uh, give a warm welcome to uh, our speakers of today. We have with us uh, Tatiana Loda, Seafood Advisor at Good Fish Foundation, uh, Tatiana will give an introduction to uh, how we in the hospitality industry can support biodiversity by purchasing sustainable harvested fish and seafood. I would also like to welcome uh, Rosie Teasdale, which is uh, Executive Director at the Forest Stewardship Council, or FSC, in the United Kingdom. Uh, Rosie will tell us more about how we can support biodiversity by buying sustainably harvested paper and uh, wood products. And thirdly, I would like to warmly welcome Andy, Andy Benson, Senior Education Officer at Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Andy will tell us uh, more about how we can promote uh, biodiversity by creating pollinator friendly green areas around the tourism establishments. So a warm welcome to all three of you and uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, experience with us. Before we start, I would like to uh, just present uh, some housekeeping rules to you. Uh, first of all, uh, as you perhaps already have noted, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, if you would like to stay uh, anonymous, uh, I would uh, recommend you to turn off the camera and you can also change your display name if you prefer. Uh, we record it because after this uh, webinar, we will upload the, today's webinar and the presentation to Green Keys uh, website uh, and YouTube channel. This will allow persons who uh, would like to uh, hear the presentation but might be busy with other tasks during the scheduled time of the webinar to see the presentation at a later stage. If you feel that any of your colleagues could benefit from uh, watching uh, this presentation afterwards, uh, it's also going to be available for them. We'll send you the link uh, so that you can uh, uh, forward the recording. Uh, it's a little bit easier if you stay uh, muted during the webinar so that we don't disturb the presenters. Um, uh, if you have any questions to them, I hope you will have that. Uh, please write them in the chat and uh, we will have your questions answered uh, in the Q&A session after the presentation. And after the webinar, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please send them uh, to me. Don't hesitate to do that, uh, fin at fee.global. Finally, I would also like to do a little bit of promotion uh, of our fourth and final webinar in this series that will take place uh, uh, the 24th of, uh, of May, so in 12 days, same time uh, as today. And the last webinar will be done together with our sister program in the Blue Flag, uh, the Blue Flag program for beaches, marinas, and tourism boats. And in this webinar, we'll try to focus on concrete examples showcased from Green Key uh, establishments and Blue Flag sites uh, on examples of actions that's, or in initiatives that's been done to protect uh, biodiversity. As this is the third one, we also already had two, as you can imagine, and they are also uploaded already to our YouTube channel, and you can find the link to them on, on our website. Okay, that's the housekeeping rules. Uh, 
Now let's get started with the presentations. And the first presenter will be Rosie, Rosie Teasdale, Executive Director at the FSC UK. And please remember that if you have any questions to Rosie, please uh, just uh, put them in the chat. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen and Rosie, the floor is yours. Uh, let me see how I do this. Is that working? Great, thank you very much. And firstly, thank you ever so much for inviting me to take part on this biodiversity webinar. My background is in conservation biology, so this is an area that's very close to my heart. Um, as Finn says, I'm Executive Director of the Forest Stewardship Council here in the UK. Um, and my background is in conservation biology, but I do have a little bit of hospitality sector experience. I have worked in a hotel and I have uh, previously helped with a restaurant business. So I do appreciate that you've got to balance the challenges of doing the right thing with the fact that you also need to um, at least break even, if not make a profit, um, and, and realise those, those challenges and decisions you have to make. The fact that you've joined this webinar, um, I think probably speaks volumes about what you feel about biodiversity and the importance of it anyway, but I'm just gonna start with some consumer research that was undertaken last year by FSC, which just highlights how important this is for the consumer. Then just talk a little bit about what is FSC, how does it work? Moving on to how it relates to the hospitality and tourism sector, and then really the, the key point of what can you actually do? What actions can you take? The consumer research was undertaken in July last year um, across quite a lot of countries, quite a large sample size, um, looking at consumers' attitudes towards forestry, but also looking at more global issues. Um, it is worth noting that the research was done in July 2021. The world's changing quite quickly now, so some of the answers may be very different if you ask the same questions now, but it's still quite a useful insight. It starts off with some pretty broad questions about what are the issues of concern um, facing consumers by first of all asking what what issue worries you the most of these of these ones that we presented and as I say it's important to note this was July 2021 I think some of these may have moved up the ranking um, arguably some of them may be of less concern now than they were then but I think it's still quite useful to just look at the figures um, I think it's quite unsurprising that climate change is quite um, high up there. Um, but I think it's also you know, important to note that the loss of plant and animal species and diversity are still there as quite important concerns uh, when, when ranked with some of these other ones that are also quite hefty. Thinking about forestry in particular, there are a lot of threats facing the world's forests, the wildlife in them, the people who work and live there. And consumers were asked here which of these potential issues worried them the most. And here we see that now the plants and animal loss has moved to the top ranking, um, obviously closely followed by climate change. I mean, the links between the two are pretty obvious. If we're going to address biodiversity, we need to address climate change and vice versa. So, I, you know, we need to take the two together. But obviously, in the context of today's theme being biodiversity, I just wanted to flag that this is right up there. Loss of plant and animal species is a real concern. Uh, then we asked a few questions about their attitudes and behaviours. Um, this does focus primarily on sort of the consumer going to buy a product, but I think there's enough that you can um, convey over to if you're um, in the hotel sector, the products you're using. Um, they prefer to choose products that don't damage plants and animals. They expect companies to ensure that the wood and paper products aren't contributing to deforestation. And I think this is the same as whether you're using the product within your business or selling it. They expect companies um, to sort of really care about all these issues, but we can see the ones right at the top. I don't think it's really surprising that plant and animal loss is such a huge concern, uh, particularly when you start focusing on forests particularly. The importance of forests for the world's biodiversity cannot really be overestimated. 80% of the world's terrestrial species of flora and fauna are found in forests, and a square kilometre of tropical forest may be home to more than a thousand species. Coming back to this slide, we also find that 
75% of those asked believe that the information about sustainability on a product should be certified by an independent organisation. And we see this has increased across most of the countries since we last carried out similar global research. And our previous global research uh, indicated that there's very high expectations on companies to do the right thing um, when it comes to sustainability, but they don't really trust the companies to tell the truth when they're talking about the sustainability of you know, saying what they've done. They do trust the independent verification, so they do want the claims. So they want you all to do the right thing, but they don't trust you when you're telling you them that you've done the right thing. Uh, but it's good news for independent certification schemes. So what is FSC? I mean, this is how most people think of us as a label um, on wood and paper products. And the, the research found that uh, most people recall having seen us. This is the global research and it varies quite a lot between countries. Uh, we did our survey in the UK earlier this year and found that in the UK recognition is now at 76%. And we also talked about biodiversity and climate change and found that 63% of people in the UK said they've got a more positive opinion of a company when they know they've invested in nature or climate positive projects. So this is how people think of FSC as a label or a logo, but what's behind the logo? Our mission is quite wordy. It's we shall promote environmentally appropriate, socially beneficial and economically viable management of the world's forests. And basically we're saying we want the forests to meet our current needs without jeopardizing the needs of future generations. So as is often the case, the mission and vision uh, don't exactly roll off the tongue, uh, but we summarize it as we want forests for all forever. In terms of how it works, there's two key elements of the scheme. First of all, you look at the forest. Um, we've got forest management certification, and that assesses whether the management of the forest meets our principles and criteria, what we believe um, is needed to, to demonstrate that it's being well managed. Then we move on to the chain of custody, and this ensures that non-certified material doesn't get inadvertently mixed in with the material from these certified forests. Um, we also take in uh, recycled material um, in the same way as we would from material from the well-managed forest. Um, in terms of what we look at at the forest level, um, this is very high level and obviously drills down into your actual requirements, um, but it's looking at economic, environmental and social elements and trying to give them equal weighting. They look at issues such as legality, workers' rights, Indigenous peoples' rights, looking at the community benefits, the economic viability of the forest, the environmental values, um, protecting areas of high conservation value and the management planning and how you're assessing that. And these are just a, two of the, the 10 principles that we have, just um, putting it more in the context of biodiversity, really talking about avoiding and mitigating environmental impacts, conserving or restoring ecosystem services, and really taking care of these high conservation values um, that might be in there in the forest. And FSC is now, well, I forget, 20, 27, 28 years old. Um, so we're starting to see some studies looking at what are the impacts that FSC is having at the ground. And also this, this was a recent study that came out just looking at the differences between what FSC requires and what national legislation requires when it comes to biodiversity. This study that you can find online looked at Finland, Sweden, Estonia and Latvia. And in each case, the national FSC requirements for forests related to specific biodiversity targets, they were compared with national legislation and nearly 80% of these requirements were more prescriptive than the national legislation. And we're starting to build up more and more um, impact research on what difference does it actually make at a forest level. As well as the standard requirements for all FSC certified forests, um, FSC is introduced a new procedure which enables verified claims to be made on specific ecosystem services. So these are biodiversity, carbon, water, soil and recreation. So those that want to sort of go the extra mile as it were can say, look, we've, we've verified this. We wanted to make this positive impact on this particular species or on the, the water quality. And, and we're gonna be tracking this on top of everything else that we do. So as I mentioned, each link of the supply chain goes through this sort of certification, starting with the forest, moving on through the chain of custody. Um, each stage is independently audited by certification bodies and they themselves are audited by this top level Assurance Services International. 
And the chain of custody is really looking at how a company is controlling what's coming into them, how do they track what the FSE material is, and anyone taking legal ownership, transforming the product, um, wanting to sell it as FSE needs to be certified. At the end of the chain, when you've got to a finished labelled product, uh, businesses, whether they be retailers or companies using FSC products, can apply for a promotional licence to enable them to promote this. Uh, we are quite uh, careful about how our trademarks are used, the FSC logo, the name Forest Stewardship Council, um, the abbreviation FSC, they're all registered trademarks and really just we need to be sure that the consumer can have confidence when they see FSC that it, that it has been verified. Just going to pause now and hopefully show you a short video. So how does it all relate to you? Whether you're sourcing wooden furniture, tissue paper, printing brochures or menus, building a new hotel, even viscose or rubber products, um, choosing forest products responsibly helps ensure that we do have forests for all forever. Our forests are under threat and without knowing whether the forest products you use are sourced responsibly, your business could be contributing to damaging and destructive practices. And many suppliers will tell you, often in good faith, that the materials they're selling to you are sustainable, they're from managed sources, they're from plantations. But without independent certification, there's often no way of knowing whether this is true, verifying it, demonstrating it to your customers that you've actually done your due diligence. Basically, if you don't know where your timber, paper or other forest products have come from, you could be part of the problem. At FSC, we've developed a whole load of sort of sector specific guidance uh, for companies when it comes to FSC. We've got brochures on furniture, print, fashion and textiles, packaging and construction. And we don't have one aimed at the tourism or hospitality sector, but I think it's because it would just be a mishmash of all of these uh, because you touch so many of the different aspects. Um, I went away, lucky enough to have a night away at the weekend and just looking around the hotel I stayed in, you see how much paper and wood there are. And this is before you even get into the, the sort of rubber or man-made cellulosic fibers like viscose. Um, so yeah, you, you'd cover a lot of our different um, brochures. There's so much that comes from forests. Um, and I think what I want to say is you don't have to start with everything, you know, start somewhere. If you want to start with your furniture or start with your brochures, you know, everyone's got to start somewhere. You don't have to go all in. Um, it's not a case of all or nothing. I think we would say a good place to start is to have your good procurement policy and really embed that within your internal processes. It makes it more straightforward. It's just a good way of ensuring that everyone in your organisation knows what the expectations are when it comes to forest-based products, what is acceptable for use by your organisation. So first of all, we would say to purchase FSE certified materials, um, that come with an FSE claim, you need to find a certified supplier. As I was saying, everybody in the supply chain needs to be certified in order to pass on that claim. You can check whether your supplier is certified and you can find certified suppliers. We have a database, info.fse.org. Um, it's not the most user-friendly at the moment. It's in a transition period. If you have any problems with it, your local FSE office will be happy to help. But you can search by country and you can search, I think here I've just searched for the UK for suppliers of beds and chairs. You can check that your supplier's certificate is valid and it covers, the scope of the certificate covers the products that you're buying. 
the next bit's really important. A lot of companies just go, well, I chose a certified supplier, so job done. It's really important to realize that certified companies can sell FSE products and they can sell non-FSE products. If you don't ask them for FSE, they might not know that that's what you want. So it's really important right at the start to say, we want an FSE certified product from you. And if you want a label on it, get that stated right up front as well. It's gonna, it may be too late by the time you receive the material to say, oh, but we thought it was gonna be FSC. And then yeah, finally, when it arrives, um, just check it's FSC. We do have some checklists if people want to just go through and make sure it's got all the necessary information on it, but it should be coming through with the sales that the invoice or the delivery document should say, this is FSC and this is our certificate number. We're really keen to support you in terms of procurement. Um, and also, if you want to sort of talk about what you've done, as I said, we have got strict controls on the trademarks, so don't suddenly stick an FSE logo on your website without checking in. But we really like to sort of showcase best practice, uh, talk about the front runners, and really we're here to help, I suppose, is my message. Um, the takeaway I would say is remember your FSC. Um, find your certified supplier or check if your existing supplier is certified use our database make sure you're asking for fsc really specify this is what i want and if you want a label on it make that clear and then when the material comes just check that you've got what you asked for and if you need help with any of this or if you want to then talk about it on your website or anything like that then i'm at fsc uk but there are fsc offices around the world regional and country level offices as well as FSC International um, in Germany so please just reach out um, we are here to help um, it's in our interest for you to be doing the right thing procuring FSC and then um, once that's all in place talking about it so thank you very much and happy to answer some questions at the end but I shall leave it there for now Thank you very much, Rosie, for this excellent presentation. One thing I didn't know about you was that you actually have a little background in the hospitality industry, and uh, I'm therefore extra glad that I asked you to participate. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, we have FSC mentioned several places in our green key criteria, so it makes totally sense. Uh, uh, and I like very much that you are also collecting best practice examples like we try to do as a, as a hub. Uh, so uh, maybe that's a future cooperation possibility between us. Thank you so much, Rosie. Uh, I remember that you can ask uh, questions for Rosie uh, in the chat, uh, and the same goes obviously for, for the, our next uh, presenter, but we will go directly to the next one for now, which is uh, Tatiana Lodder, Seafood Advisor at the Good Fish uh, Foundation. So Tatiana, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, share screen. Um, and then presenter mode, right? You see it well? It looks good. All right. Um, this is the first slide. Yes, yeah, no, so uh, thank no, you. Uh, there is uh, something on top of yours. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if you, if you need that. Maybe you can minimize it. Is it like this? What do you see? Uh, now we see two slides at the same time. What What if you make the first slide then uh, minimize the first slide? Can you do that? The upper one. Um, yeah, yeah. For example, minimize it. Minimize yeah. it. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, well, thanks uh, for having me. Um, I'm program manager at Good Fish. I've been working there for five years now. I work in the field of fish uh, for seven years after my studies of marine biology. And I will use this webinar um, to help you make some uh, sustainable seafood choices uh, for your menu. I hope there's a lot of uh, seafood buyers or um, restaurant chefs uh, in this talk, but um, if not, please uh, pass over this presentation to your colleagues um, and let them know that I would be very glad to help you. Good Fish is an environmental organization. We're nonprofit. We advise um, uh, retail parties, um, suppliers, 
the hospitality sector, we have a restaurant program at Good Fish in which we advise around 500 uh, chefs. Um, and to do so, we have a tool, the Seafood Guide, and I will explain more uh, how it works later on. Our mission is that in 2030, there is uh, only sustainable seafood in the Netherlands, but hopefully also uh, in Europe or worldwide. Um, and we really need your help on that. I hope this uh, webinar is uh, practical, that it's giving you the right tools to make decisions for seafood. Um, so we'll um, express what the problems are um, in the oceans. What are the green key criteria? that there are now, which are the compulsory ones and the ones that are recommended, how to choose sustainable seafood um, and what are the learnings from Green Key Netherlands? Because they have already some years ago um, included that to avoid red rated fish from our seafood guide. Um, and that's something that Green Key International has done uh, since the beginning of last year, uh, which is really great. At this moment, uh, one out of two fish is farmed and both farming and wild capture fisheries uh, have a lot of issues. It can both be sustainable or unsustainable. Um, one third of all commercially fished stocks are overfished and bycatch is in many fisheries a big issue. For example, if you look in the North Sea, you have the beam trawling. Um, almost up to 50% of the trolling or of the catch um, is bycatch. And while most of people know that illegal fishing happens, it is less known that there is also a lot of unregulated and unreported fishing going on. Um, so that's unmanaged fisheries. Um, so also making a lot of negative impact on the oceans, but we cannot do anything about it. There's not a lot of control. Other things, social issues, um, there is modern slavery on the ship, um, fishing vessels. And in farming, there is use of uh, antibiotics because diseases, outbreaks are very common. Pesticides are being used. There's eutrophication by uh, fish feed and uh, fish feces, which results, for example, under um, fish cages in dead zones, um, welfare of Fish is also an issue, but it's re recently getting more attention, so that's good. And most of these problems are also uh, highlighted by the documentary Seaspiracy, which was trending last year. And although I have some critique on um, the documentary, it was really coming from a journalist who's from the vegan movement. Um, but it is really great that now many people know about the issues there are with fish production. So that's definitely making my work easier. So what are the green criteria and how to comply with them? Well, this one is the compulsory one, uh, 8.2. So the establishment does not buy products derived from threatened or protected species. Um, and to check if you're dealing with a threatened or protected species, uh, they recommend to use the IUCN Red List or CETES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. And species that are labeled as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered shouldn't be purchased. So I've looked up um, in the IUCN Red List the European eel, which is um, what I know the most critically endangered species at the moment, not only the European eel, but all eel stocks worldwide um, are endangered. Um, so you can definitely use the ICN to check um, for fish species that you have on your menu, how they score, but it's good to know that there's many fish species that are data limited. And so they won't have, um, so they will be in the category data deficient or not evaluated in, on IUCN, which it makes it then difficult, like what to do then. Then you can check your fish pieces in uh, CITES. They have three appendixes. The first one is for the most endangered and threatened species um, that are really threatened with extinction. 
And then in the second appendix, there is the species that are not directly threatened with extinction may, may become so. So the trade is closely controlled. And in the third appendix, there are species that need extra care to prevent unsustainable or illegal exploitation. Um, for example, sturgeon, there's a lot of uh, restrictions on the trade of um, the, the eggs of the sturgeon, caviar. Um, so again, here, it's very good to check CITES for fish, but it's also a political choice, um, which species are in here, because a lot of endangered species are still being traded and can be uh, consumed. So what the criteria also say is make use of a local seafood guide uh, and avoid species with a red rating system. And um, so that's what um, we at Good Fish do. We um, hand out a Dutch seafood guide. It's called in Dutch the Viswijzer. You can see here a screenshot. And we have three uh, methodologies. These are actually questionnaires um, that add up, the points add up into a rating. So we have one methodology for wild capture fisheries, one for uh, farmed fish, and one for freshwater fish. We share this um, methodology and the database with all the assessments together with WWF. And in the database, there are 2,500 assessments and they are being used in uh, 23 countries. Um, what would be good is to look up if your country has a local seafood guide. Um, you can do that via the link to the WWF offices. And um, we are, as Good Fish, also part of the GSRA, which is the Global Seafood Rating Alliance. And this is a group of uh, international seafood guides. We have all have slightly different um, systems and methodology behind, behind it, but we meet monthly to check that our methodologies are becoming more and more aligned. And the same goes for the assessments. So the ratings, the outcome of the ratings won't differ. And we have one voice when we talk about uh, different species. Um, if your country doesn't have a, a seafood guide locally, you can also use uh, the Good Fish uh, Seafood Guide. We also have the website in English. So that's the lowest link, goodfish.nl slash English. And it's also an, uh, an app for on your phone. Um, to give you some background on how do we make these assessments, because we're not an eco-label, but we're an uh, advising company. So the first thing is in the upper right, you see that we determine the scope of an assessment. So for example, um, I would be going to assess uh, sea bass coming from the North Sea caught with a fly shoot, which is a fishing technique. And that is one assessment uh, unit. It's different from how an eco-label such as the MSC would um, um, check because they um, assess um, a fishery production company. And we have like this broader, more generic advice. So the second step is first we have the scope. Then we look at what data is out there. So um, is there uh, scientific data about how the stock is doing? That advice is usually given by ISIS, which is a group of international um, fishery specialists. They uh, give an advice on the quota for the fish, how to manage the fish stock. Uh, so we look at that advice. And then we also look at how, if there is reports on how a fishing technique is impacting the ecosystem. For example, how much bycatch, um, and if there is a uh, bottom trawling or bottom movement because of the fishing technique. After that, um, I would possess, perform the assessment uh, with the common assessment methodology. That's how our uh, system is called. Um, and then we have an internal check. Then we get in step five, an external peer review by an expert from an other company. And then in step six, we get comments from the entire WWF expert network. So there's a lot of going back and forth and discussions about um, uh, the scorings. But when everyone agrees, we get the final publication on the, the Dutch fish guide. Um, and the, 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 uh, the fish species will get a rating. So green means sustainable. You can eat it. 
uh, with good conscience and red you should avoid and yellow is a bit in between. Um, so this is how, uh, if you would look up Atlantic salmon farmed, uh, how it would look in our fish guide. We have on the top um, an AC certified salmon, which is recommended. Then in the middle, you see a green rated salmon with a biological eco label. And uh, at the bottom is a yellow rated um, Salmon coming from the Ferrer Islands uh, farmed in open net pens in sea. Um, so if you want to look up a fish, you need to know a common name or a Latin name, where the fish is coming from, an uh, ocean region or the country of production, and you need the production method. Well, farming methods could be, for example, cages, raceway system, ponds, um, wild catch production systems are trawling nets, gill nets, pollen lines, so uh, angling. So you need to know quite a lot and you can ask this uh, from your supplier or if you have pre-packed uh, fish, it will be on the back of the product. Or for example, with cans, you can find all this information uh, on the can because this is EU uh, legislation that it, uh, you need to have this information. If you dive deeper into the assessment, um, you see here also the subscores of um, the fish. So the source usage. So for example, salmon, uh, you don't need wild salmon to farm salmon because the reproduction cycle is closed. Um, so that's course green. The impact on the environment is uh, yellow rated because there are problems with um, eutrophication by salmon farms. Um, and disease outbreaks, escapes, um, and management is here also scoring yellow. So in the end, you get a, a yellow rating. Then going a bit further to the eco labels, um, Green Key recognizes several eco labels for the wild capture fisheries. The MSC is seen as the best eco label there is at the moment. And for um, farmed fish, there are several. The ASC, Agriculture Stewardship Council, the GGN, is, which is also has is been known as a Global Gap, and BEP, Best Agriculture Practices. And then I would also uh, add biological um, to this list. Um, but what's interesting is I don't know how it is in other fields, but especially with seafood, there are many, many eco labels. You can see them here. Um, and it's very difficult as a consumer, as a chef, as a buyer, which ones can you trust? So we have a few um, criteria that we set up that we use to look at. The first is if the standard widely recognized and it has it been created with multi-stakeholder input. So is it not only the standard organization that created the standard, but also um, do NGOs back it up um, and how, do, how does the industry, industry itself look at it? The second is, um, does the organization make use of uh, third-party certification? So don't they um, certify uh, producers by themselves and having direct incomes, but are they making use of a third party um, certification body? So no commercial interest uh, for the label and continuous improvements. So are they putting the bar every time or every few years a bit higher? Um, and there is an eco label for eco labels. It's called uh, ICEAL. And if it's ICL certified, for example, AEC and MSC are ICL certified, and I think the FSC is also. Um, so this means that these are recognized, trustworthy eco labels. So what are the differences? I think, especially with the aquaculture, it might be interesting to know a little bit, like what are the differences between them? Well, for fisheries, there is only one recommended. The MSC looks at does the fish um, come from a healthy stock? Does the fishing production have minimum impact on the ecosystem? And are there good management practices? The Aquaculture Stewardship Council looks at the water quality. Um, is there responsible sourcing of the feed? 
uh, is there disease prevention, uh, no use of antibiotics, and they also look at uh, social circumstances for uh, employees at the farms. Biological, um, there are different biological labels, uh, for example, eco soil association, eco cert naturland, I've put them uh, on top. The norms for biological are all set uh, by the European Commission, so they, these are all good uh, labels. E uh, biological eco labels look at if there's no uh, genetic modification, uh, no coloring or use of antioxidant. Is there uh, the fish being fed with biological feed? And they also have several criteria on uh, animal welfare. Global Gap originally was um, a food safety eco label, but they've added much more environmental performances as well, and also well being and uh, safety of the staff um, is, is important in their standards. And then you have the best aquaculture practices. And this certifies the whole production chain. So the processing plant, the farm, the hatchery, so where the juveniles, uh, juvenile fish come from, and also the feed mill. And the, um, the amount of stars uh, shows you uh, how many of these parts of the production chain are being certified. And I would say choose for at least a two-star product, but if possible, go for a four-star in which the entire um, uh, chain is uh, being certified. How to prove your compliance to your green, tea, green key auditor? Um, the criteria say the establishment presents its written policy confirming that it doesn't buy products from threatened species. Um, and there is a visual inspection of the menu that confirms compliance. Well, with fish, I think it's very difficult. Um, for some species, for example, the eel, you can say, okay, no, I'm for sure this is a red rated species. But with most of the fish species, you don't see if it's um, certified or not. You don't see from which stock it is coming. So it's quite difficult. You really need more information than just checking the menu. So I think that's why it's very nice that um, uh, I give the steps that are um, being performed in the Netherlands uh, when there is a green key audit and how they do uh, make sure that um, facilities uh, comply with the, the sustainable fish criteria. And the first step is that uh, participants create an, a menu. They use the local seafood guide to see how their fish is rated and they uh, try to avoid the red rated fish. But before the green key audit takes place, they request an in inventory or the, se the selling list of all the fish they've been bought at their fish supplier, or even they have more suppliers. And then with all the specification. So the Latin name of the fish, the, where it's coming from, and also the production method, plus the rating of the local seafood guide. And in the Netherlands, usually the suppliers, they already rate the species for the green key um, chains. Um, and they are, we work with quite some of them. So they are very aware how to use the seafood guides online. So that it actually makes it easier for the chefs um, to know um, that they only get green rated or yellow rated uh, fish from their supplier. But in case there is a red rated fish that has been bought, this is removed from the menu and uh, replaced with a sustainable variant uh, before the Green Key audit. Um, I'm very in close contact with the Green Key auditors in the Netherlands. So um, I really hope that we can uh, extend that to, uh, to also uh, the Green Key international auditors, because I'm, I'm really happy to help everyone with them. Um, um, either assessing the fish species that are being used or also uh, helping with finding sustainable variants, sustainable options. I know that it is a lot of work. Um, I know for sure, uh, especially if you're going to do it for the first time that you check the lists. It might be that suppliers also are not too happy with it to get all this information. Um, but it is really needed to make these sustainable choices. 
But if you're struggling, um, I thought it would, might be nice also to create this avoid list. Um, that's a very good first step. So if you're putting fish on the menu, do not choose uncertified cod, tuna, tropical shrimp, eel, swordfish, ray sharks, monkfish, uh, and farmed pangasius uh, or tilapia that's being uh, farmed. Because there's just a lot of uh, environmental and social issues with all these uh, fish species. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to have any questions. Thank you very much, Tatiana. That was really, really very insightful. And uh, I can definitely say uh, that uh, we've been very inspired by your cooperation with uh, Green Key in the Netherlands. Uh, we uh, did strengthen our criterion uh, when they, uh, in connection with the revision that we did uh, with the new criteria, but uh, I can uh, definitely see we can do more together. So, uh, so uh, it, it's good to have this presentation and, uh, and, and enlighten us on this point. Uh, I hope that uh, you will uh, remember to uh, ask questions to Tatiana in the chat, and we will take them uh, at the end of, uh, of, uh, of this webinar. For now, uh, I would like to uh, move on. Uh, thank you, Tatiana, once again. I'd like to move on to uh, Andy, Andy Benson, Senior Education Officer at the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And uh, you can also ask uh, questions to uh, to uh, Andy in the Q and A uh, in the chat, and we'll take it at the Q and A session. So, uh, Andy, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, can everyone see the presentation? Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Hi there, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy, and um, as Sven says, I'm the senior education officer at Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Um, my role involves educating everybody not just uh, school children but adults uh, nursery school kids uh, people in care homes um, so our, my job is to communicate our key messages um, to everybody in a way that's accessible and understandable um, and bumblebee conservation trust um, is a uk-wide charity with a vision of a world where bumblebees are, are thriving and valued it's been a charity since 2006, and it's become a really influential science and evidence-based conservation charity. Uh, we work with partners uh, across the UK to deliver high quality science, conservation, um, and outreach as well. And I hope from uh, this webinar today that what you get is a bit of inspiration um, and some basic ideas about how you can take some first steps into improving your green spaces or outdoor spaces uh, to create more space for bumblebees, but not just bumblebees, all pollinators um, as well. Um, the key thing I'm really gonna try and achieve uh, is to make you fall in love with bumblebees the way that I have and so many other people I've met have, um, so that you really have a, a strong desire to take to take some next steps, um, go and visit our website and get some more information. Um, I'm very aware that I'm coming from a very UK centric view here. Uh, the bumblebees I work with are all in the UK. Um, the plant species I work with are in the UK and so, are, so is the climate zone that I'm in. So the advice that I'm gonna give today is to be quite generic i'm not going to name specific plant species or bumblebee species because that would be different wherever you are and i've had a look at uh, the map of where some of your organizations are and some of you won't even have bumblebees where you are although the vast majority of you will have um but as again all of these um recommendations will work for all sorts of pollinators and insects uh, in general um so there are about 250 different species of bumblebee across the world. Um, in the temperate northern hemisphere zone, where, where the UK sits in Europe as well, um, there, there are 24 species just in the UK alone. Um, and in this temperate band, that's where we have the vast majority of, of bumblebee species. Uh, they prefer the cooler climates. Um, so, in this presentation today, I'm going to try and get you guys to get involved just a little bit. Um, and because I can't see any faces or hear any voices, it'd be really fantastic, just so I know that you're there, if you could pop a number eight into the chat box, um, and just so that I know um, if you're all there. Um, let me see if I can find your eights. Okay, 
I chose the number eight because it looks a little bit like a bumblebee. Um, but we're, well, I'm going to get you to, to pop out some numbers um, in the chat as we go along, just uh, so that we can interact together um, before you ask questions later on. So the first thing is, as I said, I'm going to make you fall in love with bumblebees. So these are my top five bumblebee facts for, well, originally for, part, for the tourism industry. Um, so I'm going to give you my top five bumblebee facts uh, and why I think they're so fantastic. So fact number one. Bumblebees use static electricity uh, to help them collect pollen. So bumblebees are quite large insects. They have to beat their wings around 200 times every single second to stay in the air. And because they're flapping their wings so fast, little particles of dust knock electrons off the bumblebees as they're flying around, which makes them positively charged. And as they approach flowers, which are grounded and slightly negatively charged, um, there's a force of attraction between them. So pollen grains can actually jump from the flower and land on the bumblebee sticking to its fur. And this is just one of the ways that bumblebees are such fantastic pollinators, which I'll keep coming back to. My second uh, bumblebee fact for parties um, is that bumblebees, although they're insects and technically uh, cold-blooded, they can regulate their own temperature um, they can vibrate the huge muscles that they usually use to flap their wings. They can vibrate those and generate their own body heat. Now, a bumblebee needs to be around 30 degrees Celsius um, in order to, to take off and fly. Um, and as many of us are aware in the UK and across Europe, the temperature isn't always 30 degrees. Um, so bumblebees can warm themselves up and get themselves going really early in the morning and then much later into the evening as well, um, which again makes them really fantastic pollinators because they're flying for much longer during the day. And this also translates to the amount of time they are around during the year as well. Bumblebees are some of the first insects that we see um, early in the year and they're around right into October and November. And in many places, actually, bumblebees are in flight all year round. Uh, my next fact, fact, um, all the different bumblebees have different lengths of tongues. Uh, in the image there, you have a garden bumblebee from the UK. It's got the longest tongue of any bumblebee in the UK. Uh, and bumblebees, weirdly, it's a weird thing to think about. Actually, they don't roll their tongues up like you might imagine, like a bumblebee does, uh, like a butterfly does, for example. Um, their tongues have got like a hard coating on the outside, and they actually just fold them down underneath their bodies while they're flying around. So this garden bumblebee's tongue is the same length as its whole body. Um, so it has to stick its tongue out quite early before it lands on the flower so that it doesn't knock itself off the flower when it's trying to take a drink of nectar. And this is really fantastic that bumblebees, some have long tongues, some have short tongues, because the flower you can see here is, is a foxglove and it has a really long tube shaped flower. And only the long tongued bumblebees are able to access the nectar in there. So only the long tongued bumblebees will pollinate these flowers. So the different lengths of tongues of the bumblebees means that they will visit lots of different types of flowers. And other insect groups that all have the same length of tongues, honeybees, for example, can only visit certain flower groups, whereas bumblebees can pollinate all sorts of different flowers. Uh, another reason why uh, bumblebees are such amazing pollinators um, is that they do something really amazing called buzz pollination. Now, I spoke before about how they use their huge flight muscles to warm themselves up. Well, on a crop like tomatoes, for example, um, the pollen is really tightly packed and really strongly attached to the anthers inside the flower. Now, other insects landing on that flower wouldn't be able to get to that pollen. They just wouldn't be able to access it. So what a, bum a bumblebee does is it lands on the flower, it bites on to uh, the anthers with its mandibles, and then it vibrates those flight muscles at exactly 400 hertz, which releases the pollen from the flower, covering the bee in the pollen and allowing the, the flower to become pollinated. And actually, bumblebees are one of the only insects in the world that are able to pollinate tomato crops and all the associated crops in that sort of family, like uh, blueberries, for example, as well. Um, and in fact, the whole tomato growing industry is super reliant uh, on bumblebees to ensure the quality of their crop. Uh, and my last fact uh, about bumblebees is that bumblebees have a, a bit of a darker side as well. Um, as you can see from this picture, there's a, a group of bumblebees called cuckoo bumblebees. Um, and you may have heard of the cuckoo bird uh, that lays its eggs in other birds' nests. Well, 
the cuckoo bumblebees do exactly the same thing. The cuckoo group of cuckoo bumblebees, they're not social bumblebees, um, like the other groups of bumblebees that live in colonies. They just have males and females. Um, and the females have longer stings than the social bumblebees, and they have a thicker exoskeleton. So they have better weapons and they have better armor. And what they do is they hang around the social bumblebee colonies um, so that they can gather the scent. And then they infiltrate, they go into the bumblebee colony when it's got lots of workers and they fight with the queen and they either kill her or they chase her off. And then they eat any young bumblebees um, or any unhatched eggs. And then they lay all of their own eggs in there and then they fly off and leave them. And the workers from that colony will raise those young as if they are their own. And then that brood of cuckoo bumblebees will go on and do the same thing again next year. So there is a darker side to bumblebees. Um, the cuckoo bumblebees, I must add, are also fantastic pollinators and a vital part of the ecosystem. Um, they're, not, they're not bad guys. That's just the way that they go about their life cycle. So uh, just before I move on to the next slide, I'd love to know what your favourite bumblebee fact for a party. So the next party you go to, which bumblebee fact are you going to tell people about? Or the next tourism industry meeting you go to. Um, we're going to talk about cuckoos, thermoregulation, static electricity, thermoregulation, or buzz pollination. What's the one you're taking away with you? So a few ones to start with. Oh, yeah. Three. Okay, good. Three, three is always my go-to. That one party I went to this year was uh, was definitely number three that I took along with me. Okay, fantastic. Well, they're yours for, for your next party anyway. Um, so bumblebees are uh, amazing um, insects. Um, they're vitally important, which we'll come on to in a second, but uh, they are they are at risk and they they are they, their numbers have declined massively. So the, the main reason for that, there, there are a few reasons. The use of pesticides, for example, um, diseases um, can have an effect on bumblebees, uh, particularly pesticide use. Um, but far and away, the, the largest issue facing bumblebees um, is the loss of their habitat. Um, so turning flower rich meadows into what are essentially agricultural monocultures. Um, the changes in our farming practices, for example, um, meant that we do less crop rotation. Um, we're using machinery, we have larger fields, um, we're growing uh, different crops that flower for a few weeks and then have no floral, no flowers for the bumblebees to feed on after that. Um, and actually these sorts of uh, scenes that you can see on the slide are essentially green deserts to bumblebees, uh, whereas the smaller crop rotation farms where we grew um, hay for feeding cattle, for example, um, were really fantastic for bumblebees. Um, in the UK, um, in the last century, we've lost over 97% of our flower-rich um, grasslands. Um, and it's always like, it's an easy number to say, but to actually imagine that the own, that's almost all of it, you know? And um, I always say to people, if you imagine going to the supermarket and 97% of the food was gone, um, there were going to be a lot of people who turn up who aren't going to be able to get any shopping that day. And that's essentially what's happened to bumblebees over the last hundred years. So inevitably, the number of bumblebees has really crashed. And this is important to us because um, bumblebees are, are really important to us as humans. Um, they, they, really, they really provide us with our food security. About one in every three mouthfuls of food that we eat um, needed to be pollinated. And of those sort of three mouthfuls, that one mouthful is the mouthful that gives us the most nutritional value of fruits and our vegetables. Um, across the EU, um, it's thought that bumblebee, bumblebees and other pollinators contribute 14.2 billion euros to the economy every year. Um, and that's just by adding value to crop abundance and crop quality. Um, but the, the figure I always think is, is more important to think about is this free service of pollination that bumblebees and other pollinators provide to us, they do that job for free. And if we didn't have bumblebees and other pollinators and we had to do that job as humans, it's estimated that just in the UK, it would cost 1.8 billion pounds every single year to replace that service. So obviously you extrapolate that number um, across the world 
um, the price of food, which is already rising quickly, uh, would go would rise exponentially. So it's really, really important that we look after our pollinators. Um, other than just to people, pollinators are really important for the ecosystem and the, the, the survival of the ecosystem. They're what we call a, a keystone species. Um, by pollinating flowers and foods for other animals, um, they're providing that base layer of the food chain. So the flowers that reproduce because of pollination, the leaves are eaten by other insects, and the fruits are eaten by small mammals. Those insects and mammals are eaten by larger predators and larger predators still. They provide habitats and nesting sites. And um, without the bumblebees and pollinators, all of that whole food web collapses. I always say it's like the Jenga tower with bumblebees at the bottom and pollinators at the bottom. And um, without those, everything else really suffers. So a little bit of doom and gloom um, after my bumblebee facts. But the great thing is there are some really easy ways we can we can make things better for, for bumblebees. And um, it might be difficult for us to directly influence the way we manage our huge areas of land, but we can influence how we manage our own areas of land. Um, and gardens that maybe traditionally, or green spaces that maybe traditionally um, have been amenity spaces with uh, just short cut grass, for example, um, and bedding plants that are no good for pollinators, we can make choices to make these areas much better for pollinators and almost replace the areas that they're found. Actually, gardens have been found to have a much greater diversity of floral resource of, of food for, for bumblebees and other pollinators than any sort of natural landscape. So we can do a lot of good in our green spaces around the places where we live and work. So creating space for, for bumblebees, and this is where it's kind of going to come down to. And again, my recommendations are going to be quite generic here, but I will give you a link to where you can go onto our website and get some more specific information if that's what you're looking for. Uh, so I'm going to give you three recommendations here. Um, the first one is to provide food. OK, this is probably the, the biggest, the biggest thing. Um, we've seen that 97% of wildflower meadows in the UK have been lost, and that number kind of is similar across the globe. And it's really easy to provide food for bumblebees and other pollinators. The only food they eat comes from flowers. So we need to provide flowers. But there are a few key things that we need to think about here. Um, how do we provide the flowers? When people think about saving pollinators, they often think, oh, I have to grow a, a meadow. I have to grow a wildflower meadow. Um, and yes, that would be fantastic if everyone was able to grow a wildflower meadow. But they're actually quite difficult things to manage. And unless you have a great management plan, um, they may, that might not be the best way for you to go. You can turn lawns into flower rich lawns with uh, lower flowering species, for example. Um, you can plant perennial borders with flowers that are really great for pollinators. Um, you can grow shrubs, which offer an abundance of flowers, um, often for long periods of time. Uh, and you can grow hedgerows, which provide both food for bumblebees and also uh, nesting sites uh, for small mammals and things as well. And, fruits and can be great for wildlife in general. Um, something we need to consider though when we're providing flowers for bumblebees in particular is that bumblebees, as I told you before, they fly from February till October uh, and sometimes even longer. So it's really important we consider the different species of flowers that we're providing and try to make sure we have something available all the way through the year from early spring flowers all the way through to flowers that flower much later in the year as well. Um, and the other thing to think about is to provide that diversity of flowers, um, not just having one species of flower, for example, because then you're limiting uh, the variety of the species of bumblebees and other pollinators you will attract. But by having lots of different shapes of flowers, um, you provide for all those different tongue lengths we spoke about um, and have a much greater diversity of insects. OK, the second recommendation is to avoid pesticides, OK? Um, it, this is, this is a often a very difficult thing for, for people to do. I imagine um, in your industry, when you're trying to keep a place looking really uh, neat and tidy in the way that maybe traditionally your areas have looked, um, using pesticides might be uh, a normal practice, but they have been proven to be harmful to bumblebees and other pollinators by impairing their memory, for example, uh, and they, they fly out of the, the nest and they cannot find their way back. Um, 
Uh, they're also have been shown to damage the, the soil um, and all of the other microorganisms within the soil as well. Um, there are other ways you can get around dealing with pests other than using pesticides. Um, we can use companion planting like the marigolds I've put on here to try and draw the, the insects like green flies away from the, the crops that you want to grow. Um, you can encourage other wildlife like birds into and frogs and toads and things into your green spaces because uh, they'll eat slugs and snails and green fly. Um, and unfortunately, when people are making the transition to try to use this sort of pest management, um, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, generally, the pests come first because they are the food source. And when once you have that there, then the predators start to come in afterwards. So often um, going with this sort of pest management needs a little bit of patience um, before, before it can really have any, any huge effect. Uh, my last recommendation is to give bumblebees, um, in particular bumblebees, a place to nest and hibernate. Um, Bumblebees aren't like honeybees, which many people might be familiar with, that live in hives and survive over the winter by eating honey. Uh, bumblebees have an annual life cycle, uh, which means the whole colony dies off um, after a few months usually, um, and any new queens that come from that colony will um, hibernate, either digging a hole into the soil or under some leaf litter, uh, and will hibernate over the winter and then re-emerge in the spring to start that cycle of building the colony. Again, um, so providing spaces which has long grass or um, leaf litter or more untidy, wilder areas, uh, provide those sites for bumblebees to hibernate. And at the same time, those sites with long grass, for example, will be really great for bumblebees uh, to nest in. The other thing I mentioned hedges earlier, that one of the bumblebees favorite places to nest is in an old um, mouse nest or an old rodent nest. Um, so by having um, nut hedges, for example, um, you might encourage a few mice or small mammals um, into your space and um, the bumblebees would love to use their old nesting sites um, as their nests as well. And so having bumblebee nests is a great way to bring lots of bumblebees and other pollinators into your space. Okay, now just before I move on to the next slide, I've given you three basic recommendations. So I've got a, a Y or an N question now. So yes, do you think that um, you would be able to implement any of these really basic changes? It could be just a case of planting one bed of perennial flowers or stopping using pesticides or leaving an area um, in, your, in your green spaces to go a little bit wild. Do you think why you could put some of these things into practice or do you think no, it's just not practical for where you work. Yeah, that's really positive. <laughs> so as I said, I've given you a really broad brush here um, of the sorts of changes that we can make to make our spaces better for pollinators. Um, our website has, has loads of information on there that's a little bit more specific. Obviously, I'm talking to people who are working in all sorts of different countries, different um, tourism parts of the tourism industry. So your spaces will be really different, uh, but we have information for lots of different sorts of spaces. And of course, um, we are UK based charity. So um, some of our information might not be very relevant. Um, but if you wanted to get um, resources like this, making green space for bumblebees, if you scan the QR code on the screen now, um, that would take you to our um, Managing Your Spaces for Bumblebees page. Um, so what I'd love you actually to do is anyone that's got a smartphone on and can, can click the camera on, let me know if this QR code works and takes you onto our web page. Um, so if you just hold your camera up to the QR code, it should take you. So uh, just give me a, a, I don't know, give me a, an eight, a bumblebee eight, if you can get onto our web page. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so at least at least some people are managing, which is amazing, which means that the, the QR code is working, uh, which is always a relief. It's not taking you to like my shopping or something because um, I've pasted the wrong code in. So um, I'm going to stop there now that I've sent you off to find the information that you might need to start making changes. I just want to say thank you very much uh, for taking the time um, to think about helping pollinators and bumblebees in particular. Uh, and I'd love to take any questions you have in the way that Finn has suggested. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andy, both for your very concrete and practical uh, 
uh, recommendations. Uh, I think they are valid for all of us. So they are, yes, very generic. But I would also like to thank you for the fact that many of us haven't been to parties for a long time and we don't know <laughs> what we're going to talk to our uh, uh, guests next, next uh, to us uh, about. And now we have some good ideas. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, so now I'd like to thank all three of you for a really very thankful, uh, for, for very insightful presentations. Uh, I think they all give uh, some very concrete ideas and examples uh, about different activities that we can do in the tourism industry to support the protection of biodiversity. Uh, before we start with, uh, with, with uh, some questions and answers, um, I would like to first present my colleagues uh, because we are in fact uh, three people in, at Green Key International. I would like to uh, present you to uh, Marlene, uh, who is our communications assistant and has been extremely uh, helpful in all the practicalities around this uh, webinar or these webinars and other activities in uh, in the biodiversity campaign. I'm really uh, grateful for that. So thank you, Malena. Uh, and uh, normally she works uh, great and fantastic does a fantastic work with communication. But I would also like to uh, 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 say hello and uh, and uh, let, uh, uh, tell that we have Claudia with us, who is our relatively new Green Key International Coordinator. Uh, so working very closely with me and uh, we've divided the work so that uh, I'll now give the floor to Claudia because she had kept an eye on uh, on the chat and uh, and uh, the, I know that there were several questions raised to to different people so uh, Claudia over to you. Thank you very much and thanks a lot for the very insightful um, presentations also from my side. Um, from the process. I'm, uh, I wrote down a few questions and I'm just going to post them in the chat so it's also easier for our speakers. And I'm just going to go around um, through like the different questions. So um, first of all, for Rosie, we ha had one uh, question um, being that Swedish hotels have most commonly hygiene paper, printing paper that has an eco-label such as the Nordic Swan or uh, uh, EU um, uh, eco label, and uh, would you say that are there any disadvantages if products only have like these kind of labels and not the FSC label? Yeah, I think Tatiana touched on the whole proliferation of labels, um, and I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, an expert, um, and we're not even part of the EU in the UK, are we? So I'm not an expert on these labels. I think there's some uh, crossover because I think there is some requirement under these labels to have a certain amount of certified input material. And I think they may cover other aspects that maybe FSE doesn't in terms of the environmental production processes. So in an ideal world, perhaps they could complement each other because FSE is very much focused on the source of the product. I'm looking at those sort of high standards at the forest level. And I think in terms of another, if you look at an advantage of FSC rather than a disadvantage of the others, you know, our high recognition, particularly globally, depending on if, you know, if you've got guests coming from elsewhere in the world, the global recognition of FSC is perhaps an added advantage. So it might be a case of not having to choose one or the other, but perhaps using the two to complement each other. Because I, I do think that a lot of these do have to have a certain amount of certified material within them in order to carry their label as well. But yeah, I, I'm not an expert on the other labels, so I don't want to go into too much detail about why we might, why there might be a disadvantage to using theirs rather than FSC, but certainly the recognition of FSC and the fact that you've got those globally consistent standards at a forest level is an advantage of FSC. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then I uh, have a question to Tatiana, which um, is probably a rather short answer, but uh, we had the question if the Good Fish Guide is applicable worldwide. Um. So that's why I um, also put the links out there to the other organizations. So the um, we share the database with WWF. So all the WWF offices and seafood guides give exactly the same rating as Good Fish does. Um, but what we have on our fish guide is like the part which is interesting to the Dutch market. So. Of course, there are also worldwide species on there, tropical shrimp, tuna, salmon, uh, but there's also a lot of North Sea fish, for example, um, on our Dutch seafood guide. 
But if you look at local WWF offices, it will be more practical to the country um, they hand it out in. And then in that GSRA uh, link, I hope the slides will be uh, sent around because then everyone has the links. Um, and then the GSRA members, so for example, in the US, that's um, Seafood Watch. In Canada, it's Ocean Wise. Um, we have a Japanese seafood guide, um, um, the Australian conservation. No, I don't exactly know the name, but Australia also has a seafood guide. So there's many. Um, and you can look up your, um, your own local guide. Okay, thank you very much, Tatiana. Um, yeah, we also had one question about the link to WWF and to answer um, uh, about the presentations. Um, after the webinar, we will, um, all the people participating or registered will, of course, get um, the information where to um, get the recording um, as well as the presentations. So uh, thank you very much, Tatiana. Then we had uh, two questions um, that are quite similar to Andy um, about honeybees. So uh, Andy, there is a question towards you. Uh, would you say that uh, too many honeybee hives is a threat to bumblebees due to competition of food or is it rather a problem due to monoculture? Uh, that's a, it's a very relevant question. Um, there's a lot of uh, conversation taking place um, around that topic and uh, Bumblebee Conservation Trust actually have a, a policy statement um, on this issue. Um, there's increasing evidence to show that um, increasing numbers of uh, honeybee hives can cause detrimental effects to wild bees. Um, so the numbers in the UK, there are around 270 uh, species of bee in the UK. Uh, 24 of those are bumblebees, uh, the rest are, are solitary bees, and one is the honeybee. Um, but again, an example, uh, the largest bumblebee colony might be 400 individuals um, for a few months, whereas uh, a honeybee hive at the height of summer can be 60,000 individuals um, who feed very efficiently. Uh, so particularly when there are large numbers of hives being uh, either set up or brought into an area where they, they aren't normally, then you know a lot of the food resource is the same as what the wild bees will be utilizing. And um, so that you know inevitably causes a, a problem. Um, we're certainly, you know, there's no issue with honeybees or beekeeping, you know, it's a fantastic industry and we love honeybees as well. Um, but we do recommend a careful management of honeybee uh, hives um, to try to protect wild bees. And I'll, I'll post the, the link to um, our uh, statement if anybody um, wanted to have a look at it. Um, it will explain it more diplomatically than, than I have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we can also uh, add this link then. Uh, to uh, the information that we're going to send out. Um, then um, I have another question um, towards you, Rosie. Um, so wood has a big role in climate change for capturing carbon and compensation projects. By using sustainable wood materials in buildings, furniture, we keep the captured carbon in the wood as long as it is not burned or, or decay happens. Would you say um, that the trend in the future is that we need to increase how much we resort to wood as a construction material, as opposed to CO2 intensive materials like uh, concrete, glass, uh, material, uh, metals, um, et cetera, as a mitigation measure? At FSC, are you already witnessing any trends in this regard? Uh, yes, we are. And uh, um, I would say the important thing is not to have the word sustainable in the brackets, because that's a key thing that, you know, we would always say it's not a case of, you know, necessarily wood by in its nature. Obviously, wood is renewable, but only if it's being renewed. So, yes, we would say there is a case to make for that. And I think it's it's there's a push for this, not only in terms of sort of carbon and, and embedding the carbon, but there's a lot of research about the well-being of wood in buildings and how actually being 
seeing wood is positive to people's well-being as well. So I think we're seeing this. And I think um, there's perhaps been a resistance to using tropical timber, a fear that that's causing deforestation. And I think we would say that as long as you do your due diligence, you're providing a market to that tropical timber possibly keeping that forest as a forest because you're giving it value and you don't necessarily need to use the same species. There are some really lesser known timber species that are stunning. Um, and just because people haven't heard of them, they don't think to specify them, but actually you could have a really unique building by using some of these lesser known species. And I think people previously said, oh, we want to use wood, but maybe if we say we want FSC, we won't be able to meet that demand. And I think, well, they thought that with London Olympics and the Olympic Park as a very high percentage of FSC certified material, the Olympic Village, I think it was something like 98.9% was FSC. So it can be done at scale, but certainly we're seeing this, um, this big push. And, and you see some of these high rise buildings now uh, and timber frame buildings, it's definitely something we're going to see. But I think we just always balance it with it, just because it's wood doesn't necessarily mean it's all fine. You still need to know where you're sourcing your wood from. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, I have a question that actually fits to that. Um, do you, would you say that there is a, like what is the specific investment uh, connected to um, uh, investing in more sustainable wood alternatives as in regards to the ones uh, that are used, which are not FSC um, certified? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Let me post it for you. Um, the question was about the investment. Is there like, um, what is the cost? There you go. I'm posting it now. There you go. What is the investment connected to changing okay. the whole yeah. furniture in a hotel or restaurant to sustainably harvested wood or investing in sustainably harvested wood when building a new hotel? Yeah, it really, really depends. It's not a very helpful answer. Um, in some cases, because the supply chain has made that the norm, there may not actually be an additional cost. It comes down for some species that, you know, if you're looking at tropical timber, perhaps you're going to perhaps pay a price premium. Um, ultimately, you know, sustainability doesn't always come free. Um, but it isn't always the case. Sometimes there's this preconceived idea that it's going to be a huge expense. I think the question is always to ask your suppliers um, and just see it may even be that companies are supplying FSE certified materials. But if you've never said that's what you want, they might not even be telling you. So I think it's a case of asking your suppliers, but it does differentiate. Uh, it does differ depending on the type of product, the type of timber. Um, but sometimes I think we have to accept that, yeah, maybe doing the right thing does cost more. Yeah. But I can't give you a nice, it's a, you know, 5.7% uh, premium. It's not as straightforward as that, sorry. Uh, no, no worries. I, I guess like um, um, that comes along because uh, very often in, in our business or in our area, uh, we do not do things only for the money, right? We also do it for the greater good and that's what we're following as well. And I think I would say, you know, maybe you don't have to do it all at once. You know, yep. every bit helps. And I think increasingly the customer understands that you might not be able to shift everything to being this amazing, sustainable um, hotel or whatever. You can do your bit. And I think there's an understanding that every bit can help. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, then we have um, another question towards Tatiana. Um, there was some interest in your critique of conspiracy, I don't know uh, if uh, everyone has seen conspiracy, but um, I mean, Tatiana, maybe you can uh, talk a bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. So I think it would be wise for the people to watch it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a bit difficult maybe to explain. But it goes in depth about uh, the problems there are with uh, fish production, both farms, uh, both fisheries. Um, and the, the, the question the journalist asked is like, does uh, sustainable fisheries fish actually exist? And the main message um, of the documentary is to go for a vegan diet. Um, and what I said already is like, I, I really like that all these aspects and problems are being showcased because I think it's really good that everyone is aware of this and of the costs that are actually and the ecological impact there is if you choose uh, unsustainable fish. 
Um, but there are definitely uh, sustainable choices to make. Uh, there's also fish with a very low carbon footprint. Uh, for example, small pelagic fish, anchovies, sardines, mackerel, um, mussels is also a very sustainable choice. Um, fish that's being well managed is renewable. So we don't take out more than the fish stock actually produces each year. So the fish stock stays at the, at the same level. So in that way, it is definitely possible to eat sustainable fish and eco labels such as the MSC, they take care of it, um, uh, that these regulations are being uh, lift up to. But um, what in the documentary is also being done is that actually the organization MSC that is um, trying to, to push the industry to more towards better practices, they are really being cri cri criticized as being a, a profit organization um, that they don't want to um, answer questions in documentary. And I think that's a, that's a shame. That they're, yeah, I feel like that they were a bit framed um, in that okay. way. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for that. But um, it's also great to hear your opinion about it, because that's also what I um, remember or I had in mind that the main recommendation was to go for a vegan diet, which is, of course, like, um, it's great to hear from you now. Yes, there is, like, uh, of course, ways to consume fish sustainably. Yeah, and also yeah, still, with... it is, of course, a personal um, a, a choice. I, I'm really glad if people are choosing uh, to go vegan, but I think um, when you look at the worldwide picture, there's too many people um, needing to fish for their income or, or yeah. for their food. Uh, so on a global scale, it's not possible that everyone goes vegan at this point. Thank you so much. Yeah. So also with uh, um, uh, looking at the time, I think we have like one more question towards Andy, uh, a quick one. Um, it's the question is, what do you recommend to a hotel establishment in, for example, urban areas with limited space for green spaces available or also for private persons uh, without, for example, a balcony? How can we help the bumblebee? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, limited green space, um, we can we can still make informed plant choices so again those sorts of basic recommendations are made around trying to have a few different species for example um that maybe flower at different times of the year uh, which benefits both the bumblebees and yourself because you have flowers sort of for a longer period of time um raised beds for example hanging baskets pots on a balcony and um, all of those things and actually so one of the easiest ways to sow wildflowers is in in a pot because it's much easier to manage them than trying to to grow a whole wildflower meadow um the i would say as well maybe look at growing some crops in your small space some beans or tomatoes or something like that, depending on where you are um, because then both uh, the pollinators benefit, but you also benefit. If you have no outdoor space at all, no balcony, no green space, then you can get involved in, in local community groups that work in local parks, uh, group allotments. Um, you can write to your local council and ask them to change the way that they manage um, the community spaces. For example, there's a, there's a big push in the UK uh, to our road verges to manage the way that we, or to change the way we manage our road verges. Um, to let them go a bit wilder before we cut them, uh, which is great for pollinators. Um, so there are lots of things you can still do, even if you have limited or or no green space. Great, thank you so much, Andy. So the last question um, is towards Rosie. Uh, Hannah was asking, uh, is FSC accept timber from clear felled areas? Oh, it's going to be another answer where I'm going to say it depends. Um, <laughs> the way I mean, FSC works with um, setting the global standards, and then there are national standards that are adapted around sort of the the national reality. So, in some cases, there would be timber that was from clear felled areas, but there would be um, trying to keep this short, there would be restrictions on that, and there would then be looking at the management of that in a sort of longer term basis. So, yeah, it depends on the sort of the, the national context and how appropriate that would be. 
um, and whether that was, you know, meeting our principles and criteria in the longer term um, area. So it, it can it can do, uh, but it would have to meet the, the national standard, um, which would have to meet the international principles and criteria. So, yeah, it, it would potentially depend on where it was coming from and how appropriate that was in that context. Okay, thank you so much, Rosie, and thank you to all participants for your questions. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, please do not hesitate to send them to us uh, after this webinar. And for the final summary, I'm going to give my word back to Finn. Yeah, and I would just uh, finish up by saying a big thank you to Rosie, Andy, and Tatjana for their very helpful and insightful presentations. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for uh, for your uh, for attending and for your questions. I know that many uh, asked me about the recording of this so i'm go just gonna again repeat that we we have recorded this webinar and we will send the link uh, in uh, in a mail uh, probably on uh, on monday to all of you uh, so uh, please also share it uh, if, if you think there are others that could use it and then finally i'll just encourage you to attend our fourth and final uh, uh, webinar uh, on biodiversity which takes place in uh, 10, sorry, 12 days from now on the 24th of May at the same time as, as, as of now. So with that, I would like to close this uh, webinar. And again, thank you so much for uh, participating. Goodbye.